Mark chapter 7, verse 24 through 30. The words are going to be on the screen for you. If you don't have a Bible, please feel free to get a Bible on your way out. They'll be on the giving table on the way out. Um, and I'm just going to warn you. Jesus' words here, the first time I read them, offended me deeply. And we're going to go ahead and preach on that today. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house, and he did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, and this is the part that I struggle with the first time I read the Bible. Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him. Yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that um, we would just get vulnerable with you today. Um, I pray that um, we would be honest about our struggles and honest about um, Things that you say that are hard and, and seemingly hard to accept. But God, I pray that you would help us to stay in the conversation like this lady stayed in the conversation. God, in today's culture, she would have had every reason to just get mad and leave and probably post a, a tweet or something on a Reddit or Yelp review about Jesus and just would blast him. But God, she stayed in the conversation. God, I pray that you would help us today to stay in the conversation with you. And, and see who you really are. For your glory we ask it. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. So can you imagine. If that scenario. Would have been recorded. And posted on social media. Today. Can you imagine the news outlets. Regardless of whether it was Fox or CNN. That would have got a hold of that. And just had a heyday. I mean, Jesus would have went viral in the worst way possible in today's culture, right? And yet what's crazy about this is you would... That, I think that this authenticates Christianity. I think this authenticates Jesus. Because you take this story and you look at it and you're like, why would they put that in there? Mark had access to all these stories about Jesus. Why would he include that one? And yet he did. And I, 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 I got to tell you, when I alluded to it in my prayer earlier, when I first read the Bible through for the first time and I was reading the Gospels and I read this story, I'm like, that just does not sound like all of the other things that Jesus did. I mean, it just, it just, it was uncomfortable. And maybe this is the first time you've ever heard this story. Maybe this is, you've heard this story for a long time. Maybe, you've ne maybe you already know all the answers to it. Thank you for not telling me all the answers before I preach this, if that's you. But maybe you've been wrestling with it like I did for a long, long time. Maybe this is the first time you've ever heard it. And you're like, I, maybe you've been contemplating Christianity, but you hear this and you're like, I don't know if I want anything to do with this Jesus guy. I just want to encourage you not to leave and just stay in it, okay? I think there's some really, really great um, truths in here if we stay in the conversation, if we stay the course. There are treasures to be ha had if we keep digging and not just taking surface level. So let's go ahead and, and break this down and look at this. I, I kept digging and I uncovered things about Jesus and I uncovered things in my own soul. And I think that you will too. So let's go ahead and look at this. I want you to know that Jesus goes to the undeserving. This woman did not deserve 
Now, I know that you're going to say, well, she didn't deserve to be called a dog. Okay? I'm telling you, she didn't deserve Jesus. And neither do you, and neither do I. None of us deserve him. Jesus went to the undeserving, and that's the only kind of people he went to. That's the foundation of grace. I didn't get a whole lot of amens there, and that's fine. I know what the Bible says. None of us deserve his grace, this lady included. And you have to start there. Jesus went to the undeserving. He crossed boundaries. The fact that he even went into this region, he crossed all kinds of boundaries with his countrymen and with the religious elite and the leaders of his day. So don't cancel Jesus just yet. Don't cancel him. What's the scenario? It says, from there he arose. Well, what does from there mean? Where was he coming from? Well, in verses 1 through 23 of chapter 7 of Mark, Jesus has been engaged in this teaching and in this debate with the Pharisees and some of the scribes about what is clean and what is not. They, they were picking on Jesus about the way his disciples were eating with unclean hands and picking um, heads of grain. and they, they were always nitpicking at Jesus, thinking that he shouldn't have been doing and his disciples shouldn't have been doing the things that he was doing. He was making himself ritually unclean. And for a Jewish rabbi to even step foot in Tyre and Sidon would have rendered him unclean. It was just a big no-no. You didn't go to Tyre and Sidon. You didn't go to, through Samaria. You just The Jews had this very, very strict policy that you just kept separate from the Gentiles. So the fact that Jesus is even there tells you a little bit of a clue that he's not, he's not quite as prejudiced as it sounds like he is. The region of Tyre and Sidon was, um, had a long history um, with, with being opposed to the, the Jewish nation. But notice what the text says. He's been teaching about this defilement. He's facing opposition from the religious leaders. He's wanting to get away for a little bit. He's wanting to hide. And yet he couldn't be hidden. I find that fascinating. That even though, even though he is primarily in prioritizing mission to the Jews, which, by the way, that's what Paul did too. When Paul went on mission, the first place he went was the synagogues. And he tells us that, he's the, that the gospel comes first to the Jewish people and then to the Gentiles. That's the priority of the mission. You and I, all of us, are still Gentiles. We're, we're, we're the recipients of, of that grace. But it didn't come to us first. There was a priority for the mission, the way that God had set the way it was supposed to be. And Jesus is keeping on task with this when he responds to her the way it is. But the fact that he's even in that Gentile territory and the fact that his grace cannot be restrained toward even a Gentile who shows this faith, faith that the Pharisees were not demonstrating, and faith that I would dare say that his disciples really didn't even get yet. They didn't see him, but this woman saw him. And she, she, she's on to something that nobody else can see, and Jesus picks up on it. But he's going there for a little bit of rest and relaxation, a little bit of R&R, &R, and he can't be hidden. Word of him had gotten out. His reputation precedes him. Even across these social, ethical borders, it precedes him. And this woman capitalizes on it. Jesus can't be hidden. What he does tends to get out. His reputation precedes him. You can't have a secret relationship with Jesus, at least not for very long. If Jesus has done something in your life, has changed you, it's just going to start bubbling out and people are going to notice a difference. And if not, then there's something wrong with the relationship. Verse 25. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. It's interesting that it says immediately. Now, maybe this is because um, 
it, it, it's Mark, and he's just showing that Jesus is always on the go. I think that's part of it. But I also think that there's just some real truth to it, the fact that this, this lady, as soon as she hears, as soon as she hears that Jesus is there, she's heard about his stories, she just goes to him. And she, she just breaks all the protocols. She doesn't like send a text first. You're like, hey, are you available this day? No. She just shows up. So, so much for a little bit of time away. And by the way, the Herodians, or not the Herodians, but Herod was coming after him. John the Baptist had died. He was afraid that Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected from the dead. The disciples say that that's kind of the rumor going around a little bit later on. The Pharisees are after him. He's just trying to get a little bit of downtime. And she just barges right in. So who is this woman? Well, she's a woman from Tyre and Sidon, so that means that she's a Gentile. And the text bears that out later on in verse 26. She's a Gentile. So there's a separation. Jew, Gentile. Rabbi, Jewish man, Gentile, unbelieving woman. Big separation in that culture there. But she's a woman nonetheless. She's, a, she's someone who is created in God's image. And she's also someone who has a child that's being afflicted. She's a mother of a little girl that has a demon, an unclean spirit. And she had heard of him. Which tells us something about the manner in which she comes to him. She comes humbly and she comes desperately. Just let that sink in for just a moment. That's the only proper way to come to Christ. You can't come proud. You can't come not really needing him. She comes humbly. She comes desperately. And we see it in the words that what, what happens when she when she came to him. That's the idea that it's desperate. And you say, well, what do you mean? She came to him. What does that mean that she's desperate? How, does, how is she desperate just from that word she came to him? Because she crossed all of those boundaries. She just she she lost all protocol. She was desperate. But then the, she came humbly. She fell down at his feet. And that's not the way that we typically go to people. We have too much Western independent pride tied up in our affections. We typically don't come and just fall down. But she does. And then no, notice this. Says that she was a Syrophoenician by birth. Here's what's crazy about this: she crossed these boundaries. This Gentile, this Syrophoenician by birth. Remember last week when I talked about this lady named, named Jezebel that chased the prophet of God Elijah, and Elijah ran for his life. That she had said, "God, kill me if I don't kill you by this time tomorrow." Guess where Jezebel's from? Syrophoenicia. Long history: Hatfields and McCoy type thing going on with Jewish and Syrophoenicia. A lot of tension right there. The fact that she had the gall to walk into that place. Well, let me back up. The fact that Jesus had the gall to walk into Tyre and Sidon. Like she matches, she matches his bravery. I'm not saying she deserves it because of her bravado. I'm saying that we see it just kind of, just, bubble to the surface in this banter back and forth you got to know if you're one of the disciples you're sitting there thinking oh, what is going on here like man like get out your phone tiktok i mean it's just you that's you know and that that people leave i don't know all right all right i don't have tiktok i don't want china you know, never mind that's a whole, that's a whole Whole nother thing. Whole nother thing. Whole nother thing. I'm trying not to go political. I'm trying not to. All right. Long history of hatred between these two nations. But notice that she is a persistent woman. So she's a, she's a mother. She's a mother that's desperate. She's a mother that's humble. But she's also a mother that is persistent. You say, well, how do you get that? 
Look at the text. It says she begged him. That word begged means that it was like this continual begging. Like it wasn't just she came and begged once. It was continually. Like she refused to take no for an answer. She just kept on and kept on and kept on. It reminds us of like the guy who's blind and he kept saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the disciple said, quit, hold it down. And he wouldn't stop. He just kept on saying it all the more louder and louder and louder until finally Jesus came over and healed the guy. That's the kind of persistence that she has. She's continuing. She will not be refused. I mean, it, it's just brave. But desperation sometimes does that, right? I mean, there's a, you've heard the saying, you know, desperation is the mother of invention, Right? I mean, you know that in planting a church. She refused to be ignored. She refused to be canceled. And his response to her, let the children be fed first. So he, it, it, there's an illustration that he's framing this in. Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Yeah, that's what I said when I read it. What? It just doesn't sound like Jesus, right? Like, wait a minute. You can't go around calling women dogs. You just can't. What are you doing? What's, what's going on here? Before we get here, let, let, me just, let me just ask you something. This is not the only offensive thing that Jesus said he's been, he has a long track record of offending the religious leaders of his day i mean there may be one sense in like the pharisees are like finally offend somebody else besides us what do you do when jesus says something that offends you do you stay in the conversation like this lady does or do you functionally cancel him walk away ignore Let's, put, let's even take Jesus out of it. What do you do when a friend says something that offends you? Do you stay in the relationship, stay in the conversation, or do you functionally cancel them? Now, I'm not saying you should stay in abusive, toxic relationships. I'm not saying that. Now, at the same time, I'm not saying go get a divorce because your husband or wife is toxic. I'm not saying that either. But where, where's your heart? Where, where are you at? This lady demonstrates this gritty, I mean, just white knuckle holding on faith that is so admirable by Christ. And it's a model for us, I believe. So here's the breakdown of Jesus' statement. He makes the distinction between Jew and Gentile. He didn't have to make the distinction. The distinction was already well established in the culture. He wasn't setting up something new. Everybody knew that there was a distinction between Jew and Gentile. Everybody in that room knew it. Everybody around that house knew it. Jesus knew it. This woman knew it. The disciples knew it. Everybody knew it. He's just come off of 23 verses of talking about the difference between unclean and clean with the Pharisees. He is going with the predominant cultural illustration of the day. He's meeting her where she was. He's meeting the disciples where he is talking in the language that they lived in of the day. And you say, well, wait a minute. Jesus is supposed to be countercultural. He is. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. He is. But you've got to dig. You've got to stay in the conversation. You can't just leave the conversation because he says one word that you find offensive. You can't leave the conversation just every time you get offended. If that is no way to live. The problem in our culture today is nobody will stink and talk to one another. They talk at one another and above one another and around one another. And we cancel people that just disagree with us over the slightest thing. You can't live life that way. That is the seedbed of war. It's not peace. It's not peace. You can't cancel everyone just because they say something offensive. And this woman didn't. That's what's so crazy. 
So Jesus makes this distinction. He affirms there is a distinction. But he also makes clear the priority of his mission, which Paul affirms. That the gospel was sent first to the Jews. And you say, well, I don't like that. Well, I, well, I don't, then go be Jewish. I don't know. But, <laughs> you, you, you know, what, what are you going to do? Listen, listen. You, the sooner you and I come to the realization of this truth, the better off we'll be. You and I are not sovereign. God is. He sets the rules, not you and I. But as long as you try to be sovereign and you try to set yourself up as a king and you try to force Jesus into your little paradigm, you're just going to struggle. It is just easier. It's the way it's meant to be. We're meant to be under a good and gracious king. But man, everything starts coming apart when you start doubting the goodness and graciousness of that king just because of one little thing that he does that offends your sensibilities. And here's the thing. What he says is not wrong. You say, well, what do you mean it's not wrong? He's using an illustration. Gentiles were typically called dogs in that day. But the Pharisees of that day, they would have called them, they would have compared them to like the, the, main, the mangy stray dogs that are scavengers and unclean. That's how they would have referred to them. But Jesus in this context, he talks about like, not necessarily a dog like that, but like a dog in the house. Like a house pet. Right? And he says, it's not right to take the food meant for the kids and give it to the dogs, the house pets. And all of you would agree with that. All of you would agree with that. If you go home today and you say, you know what, Johnny, you're going to have to sit over there on the dog bed and we're going to put, you know, Rex up here at your table and we're going to let him lick off the plate and then we're going to take that plate and we're going to go over there and feed it to Johnny and say, you get to have the crumbs off that table. You should have CPS called on you if you do that. You know this, right? You know this. He's using this illustration. He's saying, it's not right. There are, you can't just. And, and her response is amazing. She, Jesus is crossing boundaries. But not the ones you think he is. He says that. His mission is to the Jew first. And yet, this woman, because of, his, because of her, her faithfulness, because of her persistence, his heart cannot help but be moved by that. It bends toward her. And I want you to see that about Christ. His heart always bends towards grace. It always bends towards grace. It always bends toward the undeserving. It always bends... Toward the have-nots. And that's what this lady is. And that's what you and I are. We don't deserve it. But Jesus gives it to her anyway. Theologically, she did not deserve Jesus. Culturally, she did not deserve Jesus. And none of us do either. We don't deserve him. And if you think that you deserve Jesus, you've knocked the whole foundation of grace out. We don't deserve him, but we get him. Mysteriously, faithfully speaking, she's not offended. She's not offended. She agrees with him. Look at what she says. She answered him, Yes, Lord. She agreed. That is incredible. Yes, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs. She didn't deny that she was a dog. Now, depending on where you're at, you may say, well, she's just so beat down culturally and, you know, socially that she's just, you know, no, no. Don't start reading that stuff into the actual text. Don't do that. That's called eisegesis which makes you a Jesus and you're not Jesus. 
Don't do that. Okay? We're all about exegesis here. Not extra Jesus, exegesis. All right? Take the text, extrapolate from it, exit out of what is actually there. She is exhibiting a faith and a grasp of who Jesus is, who Jesus really is, and what he is really about that no one up to this point in Mark has grasped, has, has gotten a hold of. Not even the disciples. And what she says, like we said, is true also. Yes, Lord, I'm a dog. The, in the cultural metaphor, yes, I accept that I am. Imagine her, it, it, like, yes, Lord, it's true. I'm not Jewish. I've been called a dog by your people more times than you or I can count. I know how your people see me. But dogs get fed too. Maybe not first, maybe not as much. And that's fine because I'm not asking. I'm not asking for a full meal. I'm not asking for everything that the kids get. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking for one tiny little crumb. I'm asking for one crumb. I'm asking for one little miracle. I've heard about you. I've heard what you can do. I've heard about your compassion. I've heard about your miracles. What you've done over there in Judea, has, it, it has gotten out. I know what you do. And I'm telling you, I'm desperate. I'm asking for one little crumb, one little miracle. Would you please help my little girl? I can't do this. I, I've tried. I've gone to all of my pagan rituals. I've done everything that they've asked me to do. And I can't get this thing done. I cannot fix this. You are my only hope. Will you please do this? I've heard about you. I've been told that you're compassionate. I, don't, I know I don't deserve this. I'm not coming to you on the basis of my human dignity. I'm not coming to you on the basis of my character. I'm not coming to you on the basis of my good works. I'm not coming to you on the basis of cultural appropriation. I'm not coming to you on the basis of all these other things. I am coming to you on the basis of your grace and your grace alone. My character doesn't make me deserving. I'm in need and I've heard that you're compassionate. Will you heal my daughter? And I'm telling you that when you get to that point where this lady is, when you get to there, Jesus' heart, his compassion cannot be restrained toward you. It naturally flows out toward you. But he doesn't go to the proud. He opposes the proud. If you're too prideful to come to Jesus, he will, not, he will not go toward you. He opposes the proud. But toward the humble, man, you get all of him. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. He healed that little girl immediately. And he wasn't even there. You ever think about that? Like Alexander Graham Bell. How crazy you got to be to like dream up an idea of like, I want to talk to somebody who's not even here. Jesus healed that little girl and he wasn't even physically present with her. No prescription to go fill. Don't stop by CVS on your way home. No series of exercises to do once you get there. She's healed now. She's freed now. Now, I know typically in sermons, people don't ask you, imagine being a demon. I know that. But, but just, just use your sanctified imagination for just a second. Here's this little demon going about his little demon business. Just sitting there. You know, just oppressing and doing all kinds of stuff. And all of a sudden, you're just gone. No warning. Nothing. You didn't even see him coming because he wasn't even there. Can you imagine that? Like he like 
goes back to hell, dragging his tail between his legs, talking, you know, because demons have tails. And, you know, you know, <laughs> Satan is over there like, what are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. What do you mean you don't know? You're supposed to be oppressing that little girl. I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and I'm telling you, I can't. Well, what happened? I don't know. Did somebody say something to you? No. Did somebody do something to you? No. What happened? I don't know. I was sitting there afflicting her one minute, and the next minute I was gone. What do you mean gone? Transported here, gone. I just teleported. Spock beamed me up. I don't know. I was just here. Well, go back and get on the job. I can't. What do you mean you can't? I can't even find the address. It's like it's been erased, canceled off of Google Maps. I can't find it. I can't get there. This is a picture of what Jesus does with our sin. Gone. Canceled. To everybody who would put their faith and trust in Him. Canceled. He cancels sin. And He's the only one who can. He's the only one who can. He was the only one who could heal this, this little girl. And He's the only one that can heal your sin. He's the only one. Don't cancel the only one who can cancel your sin. Don't cancel him. There is more to him than meets the eye. There is more to him than just the words on the surface. There's more to him. Don't be so hasty to cancel Jesus. Don't do that. This lady didn't deserve the grace that she was given. And neither do you and I. But praise God, the undeserving are the only people that Jesus goes to. That's the only people He's for. And not only did Jesus go to the undeserving, He went to the cross for the undeserving. He did. What made this lady her salvation, if we can assume that, final, was the fact that He went to the cross here about a year, year and a half later. And paid for her sin fully and finally. And 2,000 years ago, we looked back on it. She was looking forward to it. Our sin, fully and finally, paid for forever. Our sin, canceled. And only Jesus can do that. So I want to give you an invitation. I give you the same inv invitation every week. It's threefold. Number one, if you don't know this Jesus, I want to invite you to repent and believe. That was Jesus' first message. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent of your sin. You say, well, what does repentance of sin look like? Well, I don't know. Tell me your sin. I mean, not right now. But, but here's what repent means. Quit it. Quit it. You say, well, I don't know what my sin is. Get down on your knees and guess at it. I bet you'll guess right the first time. <laughs> repent of your sin. But it's not just about changing moral behavior. It's about changing your heart. And this is where believe Belief comes in. Believe that Jesus, the grace of Jesus is big enough to cover all of your sin. You say, man, you don't know how much I've sinned. I promise you. I promise you. It's not so much that Jesus can't forgive it. Repent and believe. Become a Christian. Get baptized as soon as you can. Get up here and get dunked in water and share your story. Tell your friends what has happened to you. You don't deserve his grace, but neither does anyone else here today. And neither does anyone else in your neighborhood. Neither does anyone else in your family. No one deserves His grace. But your sin can be canceled today. And some of you are saying, I, man, I want that. That's what I want to happen. How, just tell me the words to say. Say, Jesus, I believe that you can forgive sin. And I'm coming to you on the basis of your grace and your grace alone. I don't deserve it. But Jesus, if you'll forgive me, if, if this, what this guy says is true, if your word is true, then Jesus, that's what I want. Will you please forgive me? Just tell him that in your own words and he'll forgive you. Secondly, communion. If you're a Christian, you've been baptized post-salvation and you're walking in repentance as best as you can. I'm not saying you're perfect. Then we invite you to come up here and, rem and remember Remember the act that canceled your sin. The perfect life of Jesus. The shed blood of Jesus given so that our sin could be fully, forever 
removed. We invite you to come and take communion. And then lastly, when everybody's done taking communion, Kyle and Zach are going to start singing, and we're just going to start standing up. And we invite you to sing. To sing as one who's been freed. To sing as one who has sinned, has been completely, fully, finally removed. Sing to the one who has canceled your sin. I'm going to pray for you. And we're going to invite you to come, take communion. If you have repented of your sin and you've believed today, I'm going to invite you to come and talk to me after the service. To just come and, and say, hey, I think I became a Christian today. And let's, let's talk about that. And let's talk about what your next steps are. There is a next step for everybody here today. And I'm praying that you'll take it. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray that you will take and you will save your people today. God, I thank you for the ones you've already saved. God, may we remember you. May we walk in the freedom that you have so lavishly provided. And God, may we sing to you like you deserve. May we sing to you and, and, and give to you the glory that you deserve. For your greatest honor and glory and for our greatest joy, we ask it. In Jesus' good, good name. Amen.